Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Khoury, and uh, I have the great privilege of chairing the Emil Bustani Middle East Seminar. We're in our 35th year, the end of it, actually, with this uh, featured uh, presentation by my dear friend and colleague at Boston College, uh, Professor Ali Banwazizi. He's familiar to many of you, I am sure. He's also spoken in this seminar on a number of occasions. And it's just a delight to have him back with us. Um, and nice to have all of you all around the world, perhaps. Uh, you'll see where folks are beaming in from. Uh, you have uh, Ali Banwazizi's you know, resume and CV, at least I think it was on chat, I saw it earlier. Let me just give a couple of highlights. Uh, apart from being a political scientist at Boston College or professor of political science, to be more specific, uh, Ali has also been a faculty affiliate of our Center for International Studies for, oh, several decades, and I'll come back to that in a second. He was president of the Middle East Studies Association of North America, which is the Guild for Middle Eastern Studies Specialists. He was president of the Association for Iranian Studies. He was the founding editor of the most important journal in Iranian studies called Iranian Studies. Uh, and was editor for 14 years, uh, maybe 15 of that, of that great journal. And he's done a number of books uh, in Persian. Let me start with that, Social Classes, State and Revolution in Iran. Um, he did three edited volumes that are just first rate with our late colleague here at MIT, Myron Wiener, one of the giants of uh, development, the developing world in political science from that angle. Uh, I won't read them to you, but they're just extremely important um, studies on Central Asia and its borderlands and on, on the politics of social transformation in Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan, and um, on state religion and, and ethnic politics in that part of the world as well. So he comes very well versed. You have the title of his lecture, U.S.-Iran Relations, What Will It Take on Both Sides? to end the forever enemies stalemate. And that's a uh, hot topic these days, as we know. So before I turn to Ali Benwazizi, let me just go through a couple of protocols for you. Uh, after his talk, we'll take questions using the Q&A function of Zoom, which you can open by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to add questions during the talk and afterwards. And you can also like questions from others that you would like to hear answered. Questions will be answered after the talk con concludes. And if at any point during the talk you require technical assistance, don't hesitate to use the chat function to let our producer and technical assistant know. They'll do their best to help you out. And I'm grateful uh, to them for, for all the work they're doing for us. So um, with that further ado, Professor Benwazizi, we turn to you, sir. Thank you so much, um, Professor Khoury. And uh, I'm delighted to be back um, at the seminar. I also want to um, extend my thanks to uh, Diana Solomon, who has been coaching me uh, in the past week as to how best um, to make this um, presentation. Um, I remember um, when I was first asked by um, Philip to give this talk, which I think it was uh, um, shortly after last November's um, presidential elections. Um, I remember asking him if the talk could be scheduled for some time in, um, in early spring. My hope was that by then, uh, that is by now, um, we would know more about how the incoming Biden administration would be handling the Iran case. Um, little did I know um, that I would be talking today um, against the background or in the midst of a new and highly critical round of negotiations in Vienna um, among the major um, world powers. Um, and uh, only a couple of days ago, 
um, after a major attack um, on Iran's uh, main uh, nuclear plant um, in Natanz, um, which may um, propel Iran to take revenge in some form or fashion in a counterattack and could potentially um, derail uh, the ongoing uh, negotiations um, in, uh, in Vienna. So what I thought would be a calm and analytical and not you know, too many current events um, you know, in, in the picture um, turned out to be a very turbulent uh, period um, for as the background uh, for our talk today. Um, I will come back to address um, some of these uh, more recent um, developments um, towards the end of my talk. Um, or perhaps we could um, take them up um, during the um, Q&A. But what I hope um, to do in uh, my talk um, is to provide you with some background on some of the key aspects of the concerns uh, about Iran's nuclear program. Um, and then uh, the current um, position of the US and Iran um, as well as some of the other key players in these negotiations and uh, major countries um, in the region and point to some uh, potentially some stumbling blocks uh, or spoilers, if you will, um, that could potentially derail um, these negotiations um, or for that matter, uh, prevent the implementation of any agreement that uh, may uh, be reached um, as a result of the ongoing um, negotiations um, in um, Vienna. Um, perhaps I should say um, at the outset that as um, someone who has closely followed um, every phase of uh, this tortuous relationship between um, Iran and the United States, um, since 1979 and, and lo even long before that, I do of course have uh, my own um, takes on uh, what a realistic um, and reasonable, if not ideal agreement uh, should look like um, as a result of these negotiations. Uh, but I think I will try to bracket my own um, personal views as I go along um, until the end of the talk uh, in the hope of being um, uh, able to offer you a more um, impartial account um, of, of the issues. So um, let me begin then um, with an overview um, of the different positions um, on how to deal with Iran's um, nuclear program and what are viewed as its hegemonic um, ambitions um, in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East more generally. Um, I think if we leave out those who um, favor uh, military interventions um, and regime change, if you will, as the preferred uh, strategy, uh, we could distinguish between two somewhat distinctive, um, if not opposing approaches um, to an Iran um, policy. Uh, the first approach, and one that would be, that would emphasize um, a concerted and multilateral diplomacy uh, seeks to isolate uh, the nuclear issue um, from other uh, uh, concerning features of uh, Iran's regional um, and domestic behavior. Um, it sees uh, this perspective, that is this approach, sees the 2015 um, nuclear accord as a largely successful um, framework, uh, adequate framework um, for ensuring that Iran's nuclear ambitions are kept um, within the bounds of a peaceful uh, program. Um, and for them, that is for the advocates of, of this approach, a return to the agreement would be um, the uh, principal uh, diplomatic goal, uh, which could be achieved through negotiations. Um, and this would hopefully lead 
to Iran reversing the uh, recent steps that it has taken since 2019, that is a year or less than a year after um, President Trump uh, walked out of the um, Iran deal. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, subsequently, uh, uh, this would seek to, of course, involve or in, you know, engage in um, diplomatic efforts to uh, make it possible for Iran to return um, to the agreement, uh, to reverse the steps that it has taken um, in the past um, two years. Um, and uh, would also, of course, uh, uh, make the U.S. Um, uh, abandon uh, or uh, uh, or cancel um, many, if not all, of the uh, sanctions that it has imposed um, on uh, on Iran, particularly the ones. Uh, and we are talking about something like 15 or 1600 uh, sanctions that have been imposed of every kind, uh, including just to give you one example, the Central Bank of Iran, the equivalent of the Federal Reserve System is a target um, of some of these um, sanctions. Um, so that would be one approach. In short, an approach that uh, limits um, the scope of negotiations to the nuclear um, issues um, with the hope that perhaps, uh, you know, an agreement or an, an understanding um, can be reached uh, on top of um, such an agreement, of the nuclear agreement. So since um, the, uh, the status ante, if you will, um, is indeed this um, prior agreement, um, the so-called JCPOA, the Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, which is regarded by many as uh, the major, if, if not the major, at least a major achievement, diplomatic achievement of the Obama administration. So let me say a few words um, about that um, and, and then um, talk about uh, uh, what the current negotiations following uh, that agreement um, uh, are, are facing and look like. Uh, just to put things uh, in context, uh, Iran's uh, nuclear program um, actually began uh, back in the 1950s. Uh, that was the time that uh, President Eisenhower, uh, the so-called Atoms for Peace, um, indeed encouraged Iran uh, to have uh, a peaceful uh, uh, nuclear program. Um, it's, the US gave Iran um, a, a nuclear reactor, uh, which still functions primarily for uh, medical purposes. Um, and, uh, um, and Iran uh, in 1968, was one of the first signatories um, to the non-proliferation treaty, which was an extraordinarily important um, treaty at the time uh, to um, allow those who had already acquired a nuclear um, capability um, to make it available in peaceful fashion to other countries, uh, but prevent uh, other countries from um, attempting to or to, uh, to acquire a nuclear weapons um, capability. So this continued um, under the Shah um, and, uh, uh, and it was in the 1970s um, that the Shah decided to expand uh, Iran's nuclear program to create uh, nuclear plants. Uh, and indeed the United States participated um, in that and uh, contracts were given um, and that uh, program continued uh, for subsequent years. Indeed, uh, it was established, it, it was able to establish a, a nuclear power plant, which still um, functions um, in Iran. When the revolution um, occurred in uh, 1979, um, interestingly, the new revolutionary um, Islamic Republic um, denounced uh, the nuclear program, program altogether, uh, shut down uh, that, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the nuclear power plant, which was still in 
uh, under construction um, and uh, viewed uh, the entire nuclear um, program as, uh, as yet another uh, imperialist design to control um, Iran. Um, and there was no, uh, you know, continuing effort um, in the program to promote the program um, in the first few years of uh, the revolution. Um, as you know, the Iran-Iraq war began in uh, 1980 and uh, the word uh, got out that Iraq uh, was in the process of building a nuclear capability uh, in the uh, in mid-1980s. Now keep in mind that that was one of the uh, reasons, one of the justifications that we invaded Iraq. So that served as a powerful incentive um, for Iran to, uh, if you will, to resume its uh, nuclear um, uh, research and to perhaps move towards um, the acquiring of building of a nuclear weapons capability. This would be in the 1980s. And this attempt continued um, during the 1980s and 1990s, all along, Iran denied that its goal, its objective was indeed to build a nuclear weapon. Um, they claimed that uh, this was all a peaceful program, which you know, many people, including myself, um, would view um, those statements with, uh, with skepticism. Um, it is said that uh, there is a religious edict, a fatwa, uh, that forbids Iran from pursuing a nuclear uh, weapons program because the use of uh, weapons of mass destruction are indiscriminate or they can indiscriminately kill people and that according to uh, the uh, religious uh, reading of that, uh, uh, of that problem uh, is, is unacceptable. Um, but be that as it may, um, the reality is that uh, uh, that fatwa uh, could change and Iran may well pursue and may have had the intention of pursuing a nuclear weapons program um, along the way. However, and I think this is important, that in uh, 2003, um, by all accounts, and by all accounts, I mean by the testimony of 16 intelligence agencies of the United States, Iran abandoned its nuclear weaponization uh, program altogether. Um, and that continued. Um, this um, conclusion by the American intelligence um, uh, establishment uh, was reaffirmed um, several times and it has stood pretty much um, until fairly recently when Iran seems to be um, on the course of, uh, of increasing um, its capabilities, uh, shortening the period um, for going from peaceful purposes to weaponization of the programs uh, and, and so on. So it was against that background um, that the United States and initially, of course, the European countries, the three major European countries, um, Great Britain, France, and Germany, uh, began uh, imposing sanctions, engaging in negotiations, and ultimately um, the negotiations that began in 2013 involved the United States and became quite intensive, um, lasted for two and a half years and finally reached the JCPOA um, agreement. Very briefly, I want to um, summarize some of the terms of that agreement of JCPOA um, because that is now the point of reference. Um, that is what is now being uh, discussed in um, uh, Vienna with certain modifications as a plan um, that could um, once again uh, be uh, uh, approved by the participating uh, members of, of this uh, in, in these negotiations um, and uh, uh, and 
compel Iran uh, to uh, observe the terms of that agreement, which is which would be a roll a rolling back of some of its recent efforts, and would also obligate the United States to begin to uh, cancel uh, many of the sanctions against Iran. So uh, here I, I want to show you just a, a couple of uh, slides that uh, summarize. There is the, the photo that I wanted <laughs> to show you. Uh, as you move from um, left to right, of course, uh, that is Professor Muniz, um, who at the time was the Secretary of Energy. Um, and then we have our uh, former uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Kerry and uh, Zarif and uh, the, Mr. Muniz's counterpart in these negotiations from Iran, uh, Mr. Salehi uh, was indeed a PhD um, uh, alum of, um, of the MIT's uh, program in, uh, in nuclear science, uh, nuclear engineering, um, uh, actually. So um, moving to the main provisions of the, um, of the, of the agreement, I hope it's showing the key provisions very briefly. Uh, this is important that uh, the level of enrichment, which is uh, the defining point uh, in controlling a nuclear program, preventing it from going from peaceful purposes to uh, you know, weapons um, uh, preparation or weapons making levels is 3.7% is a level suitable for commercial power plants, uh, but too low uh, to be used uh, in for any kind of nuclear weapons uh, purposes. So there was a 10 year uh, ban uh, for uh, producing enriched uranium beyond this level of enrichment, uh, the 3.7%. Uh, the next provision was that the uh, existing uh, stockpiles um, of 10,000 kilograms um, that Iran had accumulated uh, would be reduced to uh, 300 kilograms of 3.7% enriched uranium. And this was uh, actually implemented immediately after the plan. It was shipped to Russia, um, the, uh, three, the excess amounts of uh, thousands of um, kilograms um, to Russia, um, and, uh, and, and Iran kept um, 300 kilograms um, in order to be able to provide fuel for its nuclear power plant, which was entirely um, legitimate and understanding, understandable. Um, then the number of centrifuges um, were uh, reduced from 6,000, uh, or to 6,000, I should say, from 19,000, and importantly, um, the uh, centrifuges that remained um, were the earlier uh, versions, not the more advanced versions of centrifuges, which was again um, a, a, an important uh, guarantee that Iran would not be able to um, produce highly enriched um, uh, uranium. The next uh, provision was a plant that uh, uh, Iran had built, you know, uh, under, in, in a very mountainous region underground. Um, and uh, the plant was uh, to be used only for uh, research purposes, um, rather than for any kind of production or enrichment of um, uranium. And finally, um, it was agreed that yet another um, avenue for uh, uh, producing uh, you know, uh, fuel for a potential nuclear bomb, namely the heavy water plant um, that Iran was working on, that that would end and concrete would be poured into it um, and it would not function um, for purposes of uh, producing plutonium. These were the primary um, provisions. Importantly, um, as part of this agreement, Iran also signed 
an additional protocol um, which would allow uh, inspectors from um, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency um, in, uh, uh, in Vienna uh, to send inspectors um, to anywhere in the country with appropriate uh, notice. Um, and all of these provisions were scrupulously followed by the Iranian side after the signing um, of the agreement. And that fact, that is Iran's, um, you know, uh, um, living up to its obligations under the, uh, the agreement um, was uh, uh, certified uh, several times by uh, IAEA. Um, and then we have, of course, uh, the rise of um, uh, President uh, Trump during his campaign, um, referring to the agreement as the worst agreement that had ever been signed uh, by, uh, uh, by any government, including the United States, um, and that it needed uh, to be thrown out, to be torn up. Um, and he, indeed, uh, after um, a year or two, after two years in office, um, President Trump um, did that. He walked away, he abandoned uh, this international agreement um, that the United States had signed and the UN had, uh, had confirmed, okay? So that's the, uh, the plan or the agreement that is currently um, under uh, discussion uh, in Vienna and attempts are being made as to how at this point, that is five years after signing the agreement, um, the United States could uh, relax, could end um, some of its uh, sanctions um, and Iran could be brought back um, into compliance um, with the agreement inevitably there would have to be um, certain changes in the agreement. Um, you know, five years have passed now, and I believe both sides uh, understand that. Um, the Iranian side in the negotiations um, in, is insistent that the US should go first because the United States as a signatory to the agreement um, had abandoned the agreement and it is its responsibility to go back to fulfill its obligations under the agreement um, after which and after that has been uh, tested uh, uh, then Iran would uh, reverse some of the steps that it has taken in violation by the way of that agreement you know, uh, producing, for example, 20% enriched uh, uranium is one of the, uh, the more glaring uh, violations uh, that, uh, that Iran has, has made um, with respect to that agreement. And a number of other um, issues that are out outstanding. So this is, these are the, the terms that are being negotiated uh, in um, uh, Vienna and uh, after the, you know, the uh, explosion that occurred in that uh, nuclear site in Iran, a major event, which has the potential, it is said, of putting Iran back by as long as nine months, which is extremely important in thinking about you know, Iran's uh, capability to break away and produce a, a nuclear weapon. Um, that amount of time, the breakout time, is one of the key criteria for measuring uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the capability of, uh, of, of Iran um, for going from peaceful purposes to weaponization of, uh, uh, of nuclear weapons. So uh, it is possible. Um, that uh, we may indeed um, see um, a successful round of negotiations um, in, um, in Vienna um, and an agreement, um, a revised version um, of the JCPOA would indeed um, um, come out of these negotiations. Uh, I'm not entirely sure 
if even a successful resolution in Vienna would be acceptable um, in the United States. I mean, Congress has its own views and it may indeed um, become one of the major uh, Republican, uh, you know, uh, points of um, criticism and attacks uh, on the uh, Biden administration um, that it sold out, if you will, um, to, uh, to Iran and, and other powers. We don't know, but at least there is the possibility of a successful outcome um, for this approach. Um, whether or not this approach would then lead to the resolution of a number of other um, issues, a number of other concerns that um, the United States, European powers, Israel, and regional powers have about uh, Iran, that's another um, issue. So let me then uh, move to a second, uh, if you will, approach or a second perspective uh, on uh, the, the conflict uh, with Iran, uh, the conflict between Iran, if you will, and the United States and the European powers, uh, as well as uh, the regional actors. That perspective um, does not isolate, does not focus exclusively on the nuclear issue. Um, there are a number of other concerns about Iran's behavior as a state in the region, as uh, a, a state that has hegemonic ambitions um, in the region, uh, a state that, as you all know, supported the Syrian um, Bashar al-Assad's government um, and is partly responsible uh, for the crimes that occurred um, in um, Syria, a state that is involved in Yemen, um, a state that has provided support to a number of uh, uh, non-state actors um, against um, Israel, um, and a state that has repeatedly, uh, in no uncertain terms, uh, you know, declared um, its intentions of uh, annihilating um, Israel. Um, so from an Israeli point of view, it is a recognized and dangerous enemy. Um, and a number of other countries in the region have, um, you know, uh, other concerns uh, with Iran's uh, behavior as well. Um, and we have seen in the past uh, year or so, um, the so-called Abraham um, Accords, which to some extent uh, represents uh, or, or represent, I should say, uh, attempts by United Arab Emirates, uh, by uh, Bahrain, um, and uh, by, uh, uh, you know, potentially other countries um, in the region um, to, uh, uh, to line up, uh, to coordinate with Israel um, against Iran. So from this other um, perspective, the issues uh, go beyond the, the, the concern with Iran's weaponization of its uh, nuclear program. They focus on these other um, concerns um, that uh, the actors uh, in the region and, and, and beyond have with Iran's um, behavior. Uh, so what, uh, what is their um, approach? What do they uh, want to, to do? Well, they would want some of these other concerns to become part of the negotiations, of any negotiations um, uh, with, uh, with Iran. They would like to see uh, uh, the United States not uh, relaxing or not giving um, these giving up on these uh, sanctions, um, at, or at least to do so in a very, you know, gradual, uh, contingent fashion. That is, as Iran uh, reverses some of its steps in the nuclear domain, and as it changes its behavior in these other domains, uh, then some of the sanctions uh, could be dropped. This is totally unacceptable, at least according to the official declarations of the Iranian government. Uh, this is not uh, an acceptable uh, solution uh, uh, from the Iranian point of view. 
So the ongoing attempt on the part of those who would like to see a broadening of these um, negotiations, in fact, could be contrary to the uh, Vienna uh, negotiations as they're going on um, right now. And to what extent one side or the other may prevail will, of course, depend in, in the next few days or next few weeks on how the negotiations go and how the United States is likely to respond to these other demands by other countries, by other actors um, in the region um, to, to broaden the scope of, uh, of the negotiations. Now, I want also to look at this um, from uh, Iran's um, point of view, um, th that is what has happened since the presidency of, uh, uh, of Donald Trump um, in particular, and, uh, and what have been the consequences of the policies that were adopted uh, by, by the United States, the so-called maximum pressure uh, policies. Well, here we have, of course, all kinds, as I mentioned, all kinds of sanctions that have been imposed primary sanctions, that is sanctions that are imposed directly by the United States, and secondary sanctions, that is sanctions that forbid or punish or fine other countries and other companies for engaging in any kind of trade uh, with Iran. Uh, one notable or perhaps the most consequential um, uh, Part of that uh, is, you know, making it impossible for Iran to have its major source of revenue, namely oil, uh, to sell oil in the free markets. Um, there are uh, restrictions, uh, prohibitions against the sale of oil uh, to uh, other countries. So Iran's revenues from oil um, have diminished dramatically from two to three billion dollars uh, to perhaps uh, a million or even less, a billion or even less than a billion. Um, Iran has um, suffered by all the sanctions uh, that have been imposed on the banking system. So it cannot enter into, um, you know, any kind of uh, transaction that requires bank transfers, uh, those are monitored very closely um, by the United States uh, and uh, any company that engages in those transactions is forbidden uh, to do so. Um, Iran's economy um, has suffered um, greatly, um, shortages, um, inflation, um, shortfalls in the budget um, and so on. Uh, so the consequences, the economic consequences of the sanctions are, uh, are quite, uh, you know, far reaching uh, and, uh, uh, and profound. Uh, politically, um, the sanctions have, uh, have led to um, actually a, a, you know, a resolve, if you will, on the part of uh, uh, the Iranian uh, elite or segments of the Iranian elite to resist um, these foreign pressures. A consequence of that, a result of that, has been the rise and the greater influence and power um, of the uh, Revolutionary Guards, um, the security forces um, in Iran, and a gradual decline of the group that we have recognized as the reformists uh, in Iran, including uh, the president, the current president of Iran, uh, Mr. Rouhani. Uh, so in fact, one of the consequences of this maximal um, pressure policy on the part of the United States has been uh, to, uh, to strengthen uh, the position and the influence of the hardliners um, in Iran. And the upcoming elections that are um, scheduled for uh, for June of this year, in only um, two or three months from now, uh, those elections, uh, by all accounts, may indeed 
produce a president, you know, elect a president uh, from among the hardliners. The Iranian parliament is already uh, pretty much in the hands of uh, the hardliners. Um, so if you will, uh, over the next few months, we might be looking at a regime in Iran um, that is uh, much less willing to engage in uh, in any kind of accommodation or negotiation uh, with the United States. So there is a time element um, in, in these, uh, uh, in these uh, negotiations uh, that you know, one should be uh, very much mindful of. One reaction, by the way, um, quite a dramatic uh, step that Iran has taken in response to uh, the maximum pressure, in response to the pressures coming primarily from the United States, but also um, from some of the European countries, has been to, uh, uh, in fact, make a hugely uh, consequential deal with China. Um, now imagine the ramifications of that. This is a $400 billion deal that has been, or agreement, I should say, that has been signed just a week or so ago um, with China, which um, brings China into uh, the development or construction of, uh, you know, the infrastructure uh, in Iran, uh, you know, the uh, involvement in various uh, constructions, you know, factories, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the internet, uh, which is, by the way, very attractive to Iran because uh, a Chinese built uh, and managed internet uh, would enable Iran to have full control over the social media, over internet in Iran, which is, uh, a, a source of concern uh, for uh, the regime uh, in Iran. Uh, in return, um, China uh, will not be, uh, uh, that is Iran will not be paying cash for these investments, for these uh, you know, efforts and investments by, by uh, China, uh, but it will essentially sell its oil at a substantial discount uh, to, uh, to the Chinese. Uh, as much as 30% uh, discount. Uh, China will have control over uh, two major ports in the Persian Gulf, uh, which from a strategic point of view is um, extremely important uh, for China. It will now bring China into the Middle East, into uh, the, uh, the Persian Gulf. I remember for years, uh, the fear that uh, uh, you know, the West had about Soviet Union having or finding access to the warm waters of the Persian Gulf. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why um, Iran uh, was viewed to be a buffer state, if you will, to prevent Soviet Union um, from finding access to uh, the warm waters of the Persian Gulf. Now, China will indeed have uh, access to the Persian Gulf and pretty much control over two of the major ports in the Persian Gulf. And indeed, there is talk about uh, the possibility of China having as many as 5,000 troops um, in order to protect um, its interests um, in Iran. That has not been uh, fully agreed to, but it is one of the uh, provisions that is being talked about. So the point that I'm trying to emphasize is that if the current efforts to reach an agreement fail, um, and if Iran is going to be subjected to even greater pressures, never mind you know, military action against Iran, Iran may indeed find ways of going around these um, sanctions, particularly by getting closer to China and uh, closer to, um, uh, to, uh, to Russia, uh, um, both of whom uh, have their own issues and problems um, with the United States. Um, and that may be the course which would be much more difficult uh, than to, uh, to impose and maintain um, pressures on, on Iran in all, you know, with respect to the nuclear program, as well as other uh, concerning um, uh, um, issues that um, 
that Iran poses um, in the region. So these are, um, uh, if you will, um, the stakes um, in this um, uh, conflict. Uh, one other um, uh, aspect of, of these negotiations or one other element that could be brought into these negotiations um, are the human rights um, issues. Um, I know that there are people, the so-called realists, if you will, um, who have begun to pretty much abandon um, concern with, uh, you know, traditional liberal concerns with human rights um, and uh, with, you know, the manner in which a regime um, uh, treats um, its own citizens. Um, I must say that I don't belong to that uh, point of view. I do believe that um, the United States and Western uh, powers um, uh, have an obligation uh, to, uh, to attend to and to, when necessary, uh, to impose uh, you know, sanctions, um, to, uh, uh, to promote human rights and to condemn um, uh, the violations um, of human rights. This is exactly the issue, for example, in Hong Kong. Um, and it should be, it should continue to be um, an issue with Iran. Um, so whereas I understand that tagging human rights at this point to the ongoing negotiations um, may not succeed, uh, Iran is not in a position right now to, uh, to make concessions on human rights. But it seems to me that whatever, and here now I'm expressing my own takes, my own views on how, what I would like to see. Uh, what I would like to see certainly is the diplomatic efforts um, with Iran, multilateral diplomatic efforts with Iran with full participation of our European allies. Um, and I do want to see these, some of these other issues to be put not on the immediate agenda, but on a road plan, if you will, immediately after the nuclear issue has reached some point of acceptable um, you know, uh, resolution to both sides, I would like to see a road plan as part of these negotiations that in fact um, will insist on um, you know, the observance of fundamental um, human rights as well as um, some of the other uh, issues that have been identified um, as, uh, as attempts by the Iranian regime that are unacceptable um, in the region. So um, if you will, um, it is the agreement, uh, the nuclear agreement going back to a revised version of JCPOA, uh, but clearly having a road plan um, as a uh, as the next set of steps um, in these negotiations, um, that's the ideal that that I would see. So I would not dismiss these additional um, components in the negotiations or issues in the negotiations, but I do emphasize the importance of reaching uh, an agreement on the nuclear issues first, and then moving on. I think I've got a message that might be a good time for me. Um, to to stop and uh, and turn to our Q and A. Ali, thank you very much uh, thank for you. that uh, comprehensive, highly nuanced analysis. And uh, I can see we already have um, some questions, a couple at least, and they're not short. But let me. Uh, let me do the first one. It comes from Jim Walsh, whom I believe you know. Yeah, um, sure. He says, how wonderful to have you back at MIT and for this lecture in particular. I was hoping to get your reaction to an observation. In the US, both deal advocates and deal opponents talk about a follow-on agreement. Talk about what? Way, about the, uh, talk a follow-on agreement. Yes, yes. Follow-up agreement. Right, right. Talks as a way to say we should dump the JCPOA and redo it, and Doves hoping to build even stronger agreement on basis of a more of more for more. I wonder if this is not a political fiction that the JCPOA might actually be, ironically, a sticky equilibrium point. 
hard to do the next agreement because neither side will be willing to make the hard choices required. What would your take on this be? Well, first of all, um, uh, I, I welcome Jim's presence uh, in, in this gathering and uh, acknowledge that he is uh, my favorite expert on many of the issues that I um, talked about. Um, I don't think that is um, a fiction. Um, it does imply that not all the sanctions can be relaxed or removed. Okay, now that is a sticky point. The Iranian point of view in these negotiations is that all of the sanctions should be dropped. I don't believe that we should yield on all the sanctions. It seems to me that there would have to be a step-by-step -step process um, here. Um, and as I said, very carefully, I would insert some of the other demands that I alluded to in my, uh, in my remarks. Um, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, it, it cannot be, and I don't believe that the Biden administration is willing to give, um, uh, to relax on, on that um, issue and to give grounds uh, to a full cancellation of the sanctions. Um, I think that would be a mistake. Uh, it would be a mistake politically even um, here in the United States. It won't, uh, uh, you know, it won't be acceptable. Thank you. Um, another question from Nadim Shahad, whom you know. Oh, yes. Um, he asks, how would you address the concerns in the region? For them, the division between reformers and hardliners in Iran is not very relevant. The hardliners agenda became stronger after the JCPOA. The perception is that in Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, the IRGC had a free hand because of the JCPOA. They're trying to confront it by promoting peace with Israel, a sort of peace camp in opposition to the axis of resistance promoting perpetual war. A bit like legalizing drugs to pull the rug from under the feet of the cartels. How would you address this? All right. uh, first of all, uh, Nadim is raising the points that uh, he has always done so well, so eloquently, um, and so on. I understand um, the concerns. Um, in fact, as you know, um, some of these other powers in the region, particularly Saudi Arabia, have um, insisted that they should be part of the negotiations. That is not going to work. That is not going to be acceptable um, to, um, to Iran. And I think the Europeans um, and even the United States um, acknowledge and accept um, that point of view. However, however, as part of that roadmap, which I mentioned, and to go back to uh, Jim Walsh's um, expression, I don't believe that that's um, a fiction. I think as part of that roadmap, there must be follow-up negotiations that involve the regional powers, the regional actors, and that should be part of any agreement as well. I understand that adding these steps, adding these follow-ups, to use your, your words, um, is going to complicate um, the, the negotiations. But it seems to me that it is necessary to do so um, because um, we are dealing not only with the nuclear issue, but a variety of other issues um, with uh, you know, Iran's um, policies um, in the regions. And those will have to be addressed at, at some point. Why not bring them on um, as a sequel to these negotiations and to write that into whatever agreement um, that is written. Great. Uh, at this moment, I don't see another question, at least on the Q&A. Ali, maybe I could ask you uh, a less rigorous, not, not maybe less yeah. rigorous isn't the right word, less exacting question. Yeah. So one, were you surprised that the Biden administration 
has come forward as quickly as it has in getting itself, its feet wet around the Iran issue. The, I mean, this dimension of it, the nuclear. Right. And two, what are the kinds of pressures our administration is facing? I mean, we, we know what the Trump era was like, right. and we're still right. digesting that, still living it in some sense. But what is it that might make it, you know, unbearably difficult to pursue this right. um, much beyond uh, yeah. a conversation, as it were? Right. Uh, well, with respect to your, to the first part of your question, uh, Trump's walking away from the deal uh, was a totally unwise move by all accounts of people who knew something about the provisions of the deal, who knew something about the European positions um, on the deal, um, the Russian positions, and indeed, you know, the, the very uh, provisions um, of the deal. The United States could have applied pressures, indeed could have um, added sanctions unrelated to the nuclear issue on Iran, standing on that deal and maintaining its you know, uh, multilateral connections to the European countries. I think that was a mistake. And that was, I'm quite certain, the advice that Biden received in the course of his campaign. And, and let's also not forget that Biden was very much part of the Obama administration and was a full participant, needless to say, um, in what, um, what happened. Um, of course, Secretary Kerry was carrying uh, the, the position, uh, uh, you know, uh, as the principal uh, person responsible, but surely uh, Mr. Biden was involved in it um, as well. So uh, I don't think that uh, Biden's decision was a, a Trump-like reaction against Obama's policies that because, you know, uh, Trump had done this, now I should turn, uh, turn it around and, and do the opposite. No, no, it really was based on the advice that he was receiving um, from uh, the experts uh, within, you know, his own campaign, uh, uh, you know, community, as well as, you know, from, uh, from abroad, from our allies and so on. So it seems to me that that decision um, was made quite early um, in the course of the campaign and, and, and made repeatedly by Biden um, as he was campaigning. And he made good on that um, promise. Uh, there seems to be a bit more hesitation, if you will, and realism now among the members of the team, of the Biden team. Uh, the statements that we hear today, uh, have been hearing in the past couple of weeks, are a little bit more Con conditional, if you will, that we are not in a rush, um, that we are not going to, uh, you know, cancel all the, the sanctions and so on uh, and so forth, that, you know, we're going to engage in serious negotiations and so on. So that's response to your um, first, the first part of your question. Uh, as to what the pressures are, uh, well, I think those are rather obvious. You know, we had a letter signed by 43 um, senators. Um, and, uh, and various other statements coming from not only um, Republicans, but also some uh, Democrats, including Senator Menendez, for example, um, as, you know, objecting to any kind of concession um, and, and limiting the case only to the nuclear issue. That kind of opposition has continued. But more importantly, uh, or just as importantly, of course, are the opposition or the pressures that are coming um, from the region, um, from Saudi Arabia, um, and far more consequential uh, from Israel. Um, we have seen um, that, uh, you know, uh, just in the past two or three days, when the highest ranking um, member of the Biden administration, um, Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, went to Israel, indeed 
the um, explosion uh, in the uh, uh, nuclear plant in, or the nuclear facility in Iran took place on that same day. Um, and uh, uh, the speculation, well, first of all, there seems to be no question that Mossad was behind it. Uh, I mean, there are statements by, you know, Israeli intelligence officials that, uh, that bear that out, you know, so Israel um, did it. Now, why did Israel do it? That's, I think, the interesting question. Well, one obvious answer is that uh, Israel, by doing this, um, set the clock back by as long as nine months. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but something along those lines. Uh, in, in other words, Israel did it to prevent Iran's path or to slow down Iran's path towards weaponization. Fair enough. But another um, interpretation um, is that Israel did it to derail the negotiations, to propel Iran to engage in some kind of revenge, you know, um, or to walk out um, of the negotiations or, you know, to otherwise, um, uh, you know, throw in a, a major uh, uh, spoiler um, into this. Um, and along those lines, uh, the speculation is that Mr. Netanyahu did it for two reasons. One for what I just described, and the other in order to pump up his own campaign uh, and you know create an atmosphere that we should stand you know um, stand together you know under the flag and and so on. This is a real conflict, and I'm the one um, who uh, who knows how to uh, to handle Iran um, in Israeli terms. Um, that is um, so clearly a great deal of pressure is coming from um, our ally and. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, Secretary Austin said that uh, American commitment to, uh, to Israel is ironclad and, you know, emphasizing um, the importance uh, uh, of the alliance, which is, of course, uh, the case. Um, so th those are the pressures um, coming from those two sides. Now, let me mention one other fact. Since I emphasize the human rights um, aspect of this, just in the past few days, the European countries imposed new sanctions on Iran for the manner in which it handled the opposition two years ago. You know, hundreds of people were killed in the course of those oppositions. You know, nowadays we are very much concerned with the manner in which, for example, Myanmar is treating its opposition and there are sanctions that are being uh, imposed uh, because of that. Well, Iran did the same thing to its own opposition uh, members two years ago. Um, and, uh, and there are you know, various kinds of human rights violations. Again, I recognize that we should not prevent the passage or the resolution of the nuclear issue, but I don't believe that we, need, that we should abandon uh, the concerns with human rights um, in the course of uh, these negotiations. And we must put them on the roadmap um, to be followed immediately after the negotiations. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question from Alan Taylor. What do you think are Israel's best approaches to Iran, the Iran nuclear agreement to maximize its security and limit the power of Hezbollah? Well, uh, kind of. First of all, I think, needless to say, uh, Israel's security uh, is uh, uh, is in the hands of uh, the security establishment in Israel, with uh, clear, uh, unambiguous um, support um, from the United States, um, and and I believe Israel um, has every right to be concerned. Um, about um, Iran's uh, nuclear program. However, I would tell you that many responsible Israeli officials at the highest level approved of or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, supported uh, JCPOA. Um, so it was not something that was contrary 
uh, to the Israeli defense establishment. As far as I know, as far as I remember, there are many responsible officials at the highest level that welcomed um, the agreement, uh, you know, having their own concerns, continuing concerns and so on. But once again, to stand on that agreement and then to pressure Iran would be a far more rational and effective course uh, than, you know, uh, uh, completely abandoning uh, any effort, any diplomatic effort to get Iran to, uh, to agree to restrictions on its uh, nuclear uh, uh, program and activities. Okay, thank you. Um, this comes from Ivan Abarka, and it is uh, in this notion of enemies forever, he, said, he or she, I don't see the threat of Iran on the United States, to the United States. On the contrary, at least since 9-11, Saudi Arabia has made or behaved against American interests. And however, we don't perceive Saudi Arabia as such an enemy. I'd like to know your take on this. Right. Well, and the spread of, if you will, Wahhabi um, doctrines, you know, in, in, through all kinds of um, efforts and means. Uh, let me say that as far as Iran's um, enemies forever um, doctrine is concerned, that's for real. Um, ever since the revolution, anti-Americanism became part of the ideology of the Iranian regime. Now, uh, and it has been, uh, you know, emphasized, spelled out, uh, both against the United States and against um, Israel. However, what is important to keep in mind is that this ideology is not the ideology of the majority of the Iranian people. There are all kinds of indications that the Iranian population, particularly the young people, would like to see a normalization of Iran's relationship with the rest of the world, including the United States. This is also um, a stance that is th this more normalistic uh, you know, opening uh, to the rest of the world has been the stance of significant figures within the so-called reformist wing of the Iranian politics. It was certainly the point of view that Khatami, President Khatami, who came to MIT and gave a talk, as you remember, um, he uh, fervently uh, pursued, you know. Um, so it would be wrong, it seems to me, to uh, to assume that this is the way Iran is going to be and not to take steps that would pave the way, that would facilitate, that would encourage, um, that would give hope uh, that indeed normal relations could once again obtain between Iran and, and the United States, all right? So again, while not denying that this has been the propaganda, the ideology of the Iranian regime, you know, and one of the ways in which it has justified itself, you know, being anti-Western, standing up to the Satans, to the imperialist powers, um, and so on. Uh, but it would be a mistake to also to um, to view it as um, as an unchangeable. Um, you know, policy by, by Iran. And certainly not an accurate reading of the sentiments of the, I believe the majority of the Iranian people, particularly um, the younger generation, the educated generation um, in Iran. Thank you. And this question uh, comes from our colleague and friend, uh, Alan Berger. He asked in a follow on negotiation, to what extent would it be possible to involve Putin's Russia and Erdogan's Turkey in efforts to limit the reach of the Iranian regime in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen? Uh, well, as um, Alan knows um, very well, that is already happening. That is already happening. Russia 
is beginning to feel uncomfortable with Iran's presence in Syria and real <laughs> conflicts and pushouts um, have, uh, are evident um, in that. Russia has a much better relationship with Israel than Iran does. And, and, and I think Israel understands that. Israel also is much more comfortable with having Russia in Syria than having Iran in Syria. And there are all kinds of indications uh, of that. And it seems to me that, um, that Erdogan um, also is, is not on the same wavelength by any means um, as Iran. Um, it's very difficult to predict how Erdogan would react in any situation. Um, he may change course and, and so on. I, 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 I wouldn't pin my hopes on uh, Erdogan playing a very constructive role in this, uh, but I doubt very much that Erdogan would side with Iran um, in a conflict uh, if it were to rage. Um, in, in the region. Thank you. And now we have a question. I am just delighted to see Laura Lahoud uh, in Beirut, oh my goodness. who is uh, a Bustani, the real thing, the daughter of Mirna Bustani, who created this seminar for us 35 years ago and still supports it, whole family does. She says, uh, first she thanks you, uh, Professor Benwazizi for the interesting talk. She thanks me, I'm delighted, it's a pleasure to <laughs> bring friends like Ali Benwazizi to speak to us. And she says, it's just wonderful that you can now watch it around the world, from all over the world, even though it's a little late for her in Beirut, seven hours ahead of us. Yeah. Um, but it's great she's on. And she asked, may I ask you, Professor, to make a specific comment on the Lebanese situation and how you think Iran will behave regarding Lebanon. Will it just continue supporting Hezbollah as before? I mean, should some negotiation develop, obviously? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult um, uh, question um, to respond. Um, I suppose, you know, the question of Hezbollah cannot be, and Hezbollah's rule, uh, role, if you will, in, uh, in Lebanese um, politics, cannot be reduced only to Iranian influence um, in, um, in Lebanon. There's no question that Iran has supported, indeed created, if you will, um, Hezbollah uh, back in the early 1980s and so on. Uh, but it seems to me that we should look at Hezbollah as, you know, as an entity, if you will, as a problem onto itself and also worry about Iran's support um, for um, Hezbollah. Uh, it seems that at this point in time, um, Iran is not as, first of all, in a position to support Hezbollah and Syria um, to the extent that it provided such support in the last decade or so. Economically, it's not in a position and there, there, has been, uh, there have been serious cutbacks um, at the level of support um, to Hezbollah, which I hope will continue, by the way. Um, I personally um, feel that Iran would be far better off um, and Lebanon would be far better off if Iran did not support um, Hezbollah. I've never uh, been supportive of, uh, of that um, by any stretch of imagination, okay? Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, for the foreseeable future, I think the bind between Hezbollah and, and Iran um, will continue. Um, it depends also on what happens in Syria. Um, if Iran abandons um, Syria, that is going to weaken Hezbollah's position without any doubt um, in Lebanon um, as well. Uh, that's a very sticky point. And, and again, uh, to go back to my uh, point about the majority of the Iranian population not being exactly um, supportive of the, of the policies of its own regime, uh, many of you remember uh, that in many of the protest movements, 
uh, one of the slogans uh, was, uh, you know, neither Hezbollah, you know, uh, uh, nor Syria, uh, you know, pay attention to Iran. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's this sentiment that Iran should, uh, you know, roll back its involvements um, in the region. Um, and um, and it, there is no tangible benefit for continuing those policies. Ali, that, I think this is just the best moment to bring this great seminar that you've led us through to a close and to close with Laura's very good question, we who follow Lebanon closely, yes. you know, we're all concerned and she, she posed the yes. right question as, as did our other colleagues. And, but I thank you, we all thank you for being back here with us. Uh, thank you so much. You're part of the Bustani Seminar family, whether you like it or not, and you better but like it. I love it. But I thank you and I thank everyone for attending. Let me just say, please check the uh, chat. I think there's an address for you to sign up um, if you'd like to get your name on the list for the fall series. We're going to end, the, this is the last seminar of the spring, but we'll be back in the fall. We may be live, we don't know yet. Live, that is physically live rather than <laughs> in two dimensions. But I wish you all uh, a great spring and summer and stay healthy, stay well. All speed to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Ali.